Hello and welcome to Read Becca. So I hope everyone is having a great reading week and weekend so far. Um, it continues to be very hot, so I can't really go outside, so I'm enjoying being inside and reading. Um, I read an absolute ton again this week, uh, so I don't know what has changed other than my library being open, but uh, I think I am already, as of today being the 19th, beating out my totals for both pages and books for every month this year. Um, so I'm having a great reading month, but my week was a little bit all over the place. Um, I don't let that, that great reading deceive you because I was feeling, you know, pretty bad most of the week and that did impact my reading. I just happened to be reading a lot of really quick paced things, I think. Um, so, so a PSA, you don't lose uh, lactose intolerance, even if you haven't thought about it for years. Um, I was feeling just awful for multiple days and could not figure out what was going on. Um, was having like sharp abdominal pain and cramping and that kind of stuff and um, absolutely had no idea. My cat, who I, I've talked about, the foster cat has renal disease, so he gets sick pretty often, but he was having a couple of pukey days. And my dog as well is also an, an old senior dog who has some health issues as well. And he was having some pukey days as well. So I like my mind was going to, well, you know, we're in the heat of summer and there are a lot of water main breaks. So that's a very common thing and water gets contaminated. And so there are boil orders. Did I miss a boil order for my area or something? You know, but my mind is going all over the place. And finally, um, after about five days continuously of this, I was thinking at, at that point, like, do I go to the doctor or urgent care or something? Because it's just not getting better. But I had gone to the store. So I'm making my evening cup of coffee and um, I reach into the fridge for my creamer and realize, so I picked up replacement creamer, my normal creamer, and my almost empty creamer was in fact full dairy creamer. And I had just picked up because they were out of oat creamer and I grabbed the same brand, but regular creamer. And I've been using that consistently throughout the day. I had even gone so far as like switching from regular coffee to decaf for most of my day, just having one caffeinated cup and tea, but I was still putting creamer in it <laughs> because I had thought maybe it was the caffeine in the coffee. So that was just, I mean, I'm a goofball, so I can't believe I didn't think of that. It's been something I haven't really had to think about for years and years and years, because um, I don't really have a lot of dairy in my diet, but there you go. So I had a miserable week where I was just like physically feeling awful for like five or six days. And then as soon as I switched back to my regular oat creamer, it was fine within the next day. So, um, <laughs> yeah. So something to keep in mind. Um, but other than that, really hampering my week. Um, like I said, it was a fantastic reading week. And that's pretty much all I got done because it's been too hot to go outside. My dog has not wanted to go outside at all. Um, so let's get into the books because this is, as usual, going to take a little while. So uh, Catfishing on Catnet, I've talked about this a bunch, so I'm not really going to re-repeat um, what I've said about it. I've really enjoyed this. It was a five-star reread and I'm planning on getting into the sequel Chaos on Catnet uh, probably tomorrow um, and I have that on ebook. This is pretty short, very quick reading, very fast-paced sci-fi thriller with a wonderful found family. I love it. Um, so definitely check this out if you like that sort of thing. Next up, we've got The Relentless Moon. So this is a chonker. It's an over 500 page book. And so I did not read this all in one week. I've had it for a couple weeks and been chipping away, but this read very fast. Um, it's really action packed. And um, I mentioned this in my Goodreads review um, so far that this is this whole series really is just competence porn. It talks so much about, you know, scientists and astronauts and skilled people doing their jobs well. Um, this book is the third in the Lady Astronaut series, and it's the first one following a new character. So we were introduced to Nicole Worgen in the first book, 
and she is a politician's wife. So we get a very different character from Elma York, who was in the previous novels, uh, one and two. And Elma was sort of naive, and um, this one is completely different in that she's very sly and savvy, um, and being a po politician's wife, she really knows how to manipulate people and how to use her power to advantage. So um, in this novel, we have a lot going on in the world on Earth. Um, her husband, who is a politician, is kind of trying to gain power there and um, fighting against the, the problems that are going on for the space program. And the problems are increasing. Things are going wrong with the space program more and more. And so there is this element of it's unpredictable what may happen. People on Earth are questioning the space program and whether or not it should be happening. Uh, and what is done so well throughout this whole series is that there are epigraphs at the headers of the titles that give news clippings. So the news clippings give us this expansive view of what's going on in the wider world without having to force it into the narrative of the chapters. So we know a ton about what's actually going on in terms of um, so the, the premise of this series is that there is going to be a major climate change that drives the program to go to space more quickly than it should have um, or it did in history. Uh, so that climate change, we're seeing natural disasters increasing. We're seeing problems with sea levels rising um, through those news clippings. We're also seeing political unrest. Um, throughout the world, we're seeing refugee crises. And um, so we get all of that through the news clippings and we don't have to move away from the character focus of the novel um, in the chapters. So I really enjoy that framing and how that is handled. Um, for me, I think um, I had the same criticism of Network Effect. Basically the only thing that I would take away from this is that it seemed maybe too action packed. Like, there is so much going on. Um, there's almost this spy on the moon um, thread where uh, we're trying to solve a mystery, basically. And there um, are lots of political elements to this one, obviously because we have a politician's wife, that we didn't have previously with Elma because, you know, she was this very naive person who was just kind of wanted to be an astronaut and driving toward that goal. So um, I, I did like the spy on the moon element. Um, I liked... The, the political elements, and I, I absolutely love Nicole's character and how smart and sly she is. Um, there's also the fact that, um, you know, with the Elma York novels, she had pretty severe anxiety, and that was a major um, theme of the books. In this one, we have Nicole experiencing um, relapses into eating disorder. So very major trigger warnings for that, um, because it is, it comes up quite a lot in this novel. Um, so, so that is talked about at length. Um, her struggles with it and her past with eating disorder are really talked about and the fact that she had um, inpatient treatment, for instance, in the past. Um, so those are very personal and intimate moments where we see inside her head as she is actually struggling with this. So I thought that was handled really well also. Um, overall, uh, this was another five-star read. It was on my five-star predictions list as well. So that has been going so so well so far. So both my, my predictions have turned out to be two five-stars. Um, so I absolutely enjoyed this so much. I am really looking forward to more work in this world. I desperately hope Mary Robinette Kowal does more. And third for this week, and my first translate-a-thon work was the story of the goat Story of a Goat by um, Perumal Marugan and translated by N. Kalyan Raman from the Tamil. Um, and this one, I think maybe I didn't have enough context um, as someone who's not overly familiar with the Indian government. Um, this is from Tamil Nadu. And I got a lot out of it, I did, but I think I missed the undercurrent of of government commentary because this is very much compared to um, works like uh, like Animal Farm. Um, so 
I think that it was enjoyable read as is, um, but I really liked the parts that did get into government and there were only a couple that were very overt discussions of government. So what this story is about, it's all about this goat, uh, Punachi, who um, is adopted basically, or she comes to be with a old couple who raise her essentially as their daughter. And there are a lot of hoops to jump through to get her declared um, basically their property uh, because they were given her by someone else and not one of their own goats. So um, during that, they have to take her to the government and let me see if I can find it. This is one of those overt moments. Uh, so they have to wait in a line to get her ear pierced with a tag and a number. Um, so while they're doing that, um, the discussion that happens is, uh, is this. Uh, that's why we're training ourselves to stand in queues today. We have to get used to queues. We must make queuing a habit. It's important to train ourselves for queues. We need queues for everything. We must get used to standing in queues. We must get used to waiting in queues. Queues will make us patient. Queues will make us tolerant. We must get used to queues. We must make queues a habit. Anyway, only those of us who own just one or two goats have to suffer like this. We drag our goats and kids along in the scorching heat and stand for long hours in the queue. It's such an ordeal. What happens to those who have one or two hundred goats? Haven't you heard? The regime has made arrangements to send its officers to them. They will get the ear piercing done for their goats, eat their food, and come back. It is we who must suffer. I know there's a man in our village who owns a thousand goats. Just think, a thousand goats. If he opens the yard and lets them out, all the fields and groves will look, look like goats. And even that's nothing. When they spread out to graze, we think the whole world is make up, made up of goats. That's what it would look like. How can the officer who comes to pierce their ears even count the number of goats? Whatever the owner says will become his head count. If you grease his palm with a few coins, he will close his eyes, pierce his ears of only those kids that are pointed out to him, bow and scrape before the owner and come back. That's the way it is, Aya. We did, when did the rich even suffer any hardship? It's only poor people who come here like fools and stand in the queue and suffer. Speak softly, sir. The regime has ears on all sides. There's an old saying that the regime is deaf. It's only deaf when we speak about our problems. When we talk about the regime, its ears are quite sharp. So I liked those overt government messages, um, but in terms of the more layered themes, there is a very feminist story to this, um, not related to whatever the government story is. And um, I think for me, in throughout this novel, we follow Punachi as she's going through the life cycle of a woman. And I did look up some kind of critical analysis on this and um, found that there, there is that element where Punachi symbolizes a woman and the treatment of women by the government. So, um, so I didn't really get those government elements, but uh, we see the old couple, when they receive her, she's very fragile and they treat her in both ways of being a blessing and this almost child to them, but then also seeing her as a curse at times. So um, they mistreat her sometimes. There's not any like descriptive or detailed animal abuse throughout here, but they, they do underfeed her in order to pass her off as a younger goat than she is. Um, they go through periods where they see her as this massive burden to them and they want to get rid of her. Um, and going through that, we see that she's, she's kind of always um, to be used by other people um, or other goats in many cases. Um, so she doesn't really have an identity of her own a lot of the time. Um, even when we're in her head, it's very often about what other people think. Um, and then uh, the, the life cycle that she goes through is very much that of a woman, as I said, kind of those, those milestone events coming up um, as a young woman grows. And um, we do get a lot of gross um, kind of animal content. So we see kind of mating and uh, butchery and um, kind of farmyard stuff. Um, so if you don't like gross animal stuff, this might not be the one for you. Um, but I was I was quite glad there wasn't a lot of like animal cruelty in here. 
Um, and then the, the very end, the ending and the way that it closes, um, I found it very helpful that the translator's note explains this, um, and I won't say what the actual ending is, but it ties into a Tamil uh, a folk tale, essentially, where it's something that is almost extolled um, for uh, the loss of a girl's innocence. And uh, so this symbolism is used <clears throat> at the end in criticism of that. Um, so I can definitely see having that context, but I, I do wish the translator's note had a lot more of that explanation. Um, so overall, I really like this. I would say it was a three and a half out of five just because I didn't get that larger context. Um, I think it was a very harrowing commentary from a feminist perspective, and I think it's well worth reading just for that. And then, so, more stuff that I probably will only talk about today. I don't think I will wrap these up again. Um, so I'm almost two-thirds of the way through um, the new Alyssa Cole, How to Find a Princess. Um, I will almost certainly finish this this weekend, so this will be going back to the library, likely today. Um, this is the next book in the Runaway Royals book, uh, Runaway Royals series, second book in the Runaway Royals series, and this one follows um, Bezzarina Cecivalieri, who we met in the first book, and she works for the World Federation of Monarchs. Uh, she also runs a damsels in distress <laughs> um, business of her own, and um, she, with the WFM, uh, hunts down lost royals and also um, kind of vets royal matches. So in this case, we have a lost royal slash secret royal trope where Makeda is in America and her grandmother has always told tales of the fling she had with an African prince. And um, so we find out that in fact she is r most likely the heir. Um, but before all of that, at the beginning of the book, she kind of loses everything. So Makeda has been a people pleaser because her mother was a recovering addict. Um, growing up, she was obsessed with this royal story as kind of a, a means of hope, her mother was. And um, it became a destructive thing in their life. Uh, but not only that, because this story was so pervasive in her childhood, uh, she got bullied a lot for being known as the girl who claimed she was going to be a princess. So she is really against and reluctant to uh, take on this claim of princess. Um, but she has lost her job working at a supermarket. Her girlfriend uh, has left her right before she could even tell her girlfriend that she lost her job. Um, her, her girlfriend told her that she's leaving and is going to be moving out and breaking up with her because she has no identity of her own. She is such a people pleaser that she lives just to serve others and do whatever will make them happy. Um, so through all of this, she winds up living with her grandmother who had the fling with the prince, um, who's encouraging her to use this time to seek out um, her, her identity. And uh, they run a bed and breakfast. And of course, Bez shows up um, after the, the claim is um, noticed, and uh, because Makeda is so resistant, Bez ends up staying at the bed and breakfast to convince her and is not going to leave without her. Um, so I don't think it's a spoiler to say, obviously, Bez ends up convincing her to go and Makeda goes along to um, Iberania, the kingdom. But not only that, Bez is um, of the Cheshvalieri family who are the royal guard to the Iberanian royals. So they have this um, almost personal connection because of that, even though Makeda doesn't want to admit it. Uh, so they end up taking a very scenic route back to Iberania, uh, where they get to know each other. And um, one of the things I love about all of Alyssa Cole's uh, works that I've read, um, both from the contemporary series and the historical series, she starts her characters off on the wrong foot. So they always have to get through and get to know each other um, before they actually have a relationship. So she has kind of slower burning romances. So that for me very much works. I like hate to love for the same reason, um, because these characters that have an abrasive, uh, contentious relationship 
end up having to actually get to know each other and learn more about each other rather than just, you know, jumping into a, um, some sexual relationship. So I think at, at this point, we still haven't had any sexy times. So it's not a terribly spicy book. Um, and I, I definitely will be flying through this. I think I have about 100 pages left. Um, so really enjoying this. I've enjoyed all of Alyssa Cole's work. So uh, enjoying that, I will probably return that today. And then uh, this was kind of a random pickup. I picked up After the Ever After by Jacqueline Woodson. And uh, Jacqueline Woodson is obviously a very well-known author. Um, she has written for both, well, for really all ages. Um, but this is a middle grade work. Um, it is written in verse, as you can kind of see. And <clears throat> so it is a novel, but the the verse works. So <clears throat> you can see they're, they're almost like short poems. Um, but this follows ZJ, and his dad is a professional football player. And this novel is very much about the pressures he feels from the rest of the world and his friends um, about the fact that they kind of expect him to follow in his dad's footsteps, but he maybe doesn't really want to do that starting out. And then slowly we get this um, thread and realization where he's seeing his dad change. We're having kind of violent mood swings. Um, we're also seeing his dad start forgetting things. So obviously as an adult, you know, I know that this is a CTE caused by concussions from football. We see his dad being told to take time off from his work. Um, so this is very much him processing that and what his feelings are about what his dad is going through and how that's affecting him um, and his questions about that and how he kind of doesn't really understand what's going on. So um, I doubt I will have very much to say about that, even though, you know, I read almost two thirds in one sitting. So I, I will certainly finish this today uh, or maybe tomorrow morning uh, when I have time, but wonderful read. I think it's beautifully written. I think if you're trying to get someone young into reading poetry, this would be a great way to start. So that is what, that is actually my pile that is now going back to the library is this. Look at all that. That's crazy. Um, so then um, when I was picking that up, so I was just browsing the middle grade shelves when I picked that one up. Um, and I also picked up another one, uh, The Night Diary by Vera Hiranandani. And um, this is all about a girl during the time when Pakistan and uh, India were being separated. So let me just read this this one. Um, on the eve of her 12th birthday, Nisha receives a journal, a place to record the thoughts she can never seem to say aloud as she starts to see the world through older eyes. But it's not just Nisha who is changing. She doesn't even recognize her country anymore. It's 1947 and India, newly freed from British rule, is being divided into two countries, Pakistan and India. Many people are killed crossing borders as tensions among Hindus, Muslims, Sikhs, and others flare. Nisha doesn't know which side she's supposed to be on or why she has to choose. After losing her mother, who died giving birth, she can't imagine losing her homeland too. Mama was a Muslim and now she's gone. Papa is Hindu and says it's no longer safe for them to stay in Pakistan. And so Nisha and her family become refugees and embark in a dangerous journey by train and by foot to reach their new home on the other side of the border. And really gorgeous end papers, the map. Um, but this is told in letters that she's writing in this diary, but she's writing letters to her mother who's no longer there. So um, that one looked really interesting to me. This one is a Newbery Honor. Um, so this is at kind of the very back of the line. So I probably will not really talk about this until I do get to it, which may be a few weeks, um, because that was just a total random pickup that I had. Um, then I have also started one of my original library call from the very first time when it reopened uh, is Rape a Crime by Michelle Bodler. This is incredibly good. Um, so far I'm not too far into it and it's still mostly memoir. Uh, there's not any graphic description of her experience with rape, but there is some very detailed um, explanations about what happened to her after. So going through um, talking to police, 
um, the immediate after effects of, of going to a neighbor's and calling the police, um, going through going to a hospital and having a rape kit done. Uh, so that kind of stuff, going through counseling and groups for victims um, and kind of all of the anger that she, she felt about that. So this is very much written from a place of anger. And I think that is uh, the right tone for it personally. But if you kind of don't get along with that um, sort of tone, uh, this may or may not work for you. So I'm looking to get through this uh, a little bit more this week. So next up, my translated work, we're back to those. Um, I picked up Autobiography of a Corpse by Sigmund Krizansovsky and translated by uh, Joanne Turnbull from Russian. And um, this was a total random pickup. So I actually just picked one of the short, short stories. Um, most of these seem to be more novelette length, um, but I wanted to see if I liked the writing. So I picked the story 30 Pieces of Silver, which obviously by the title you can kind of guess, but it follows um, something to do with Judas from the Bible. And let me read you this bit of the premise where it's actually coming from the perspective of an author, of a writer. Uh, talking about this. After all, who and what remained of this gospel story about deaths? One man was crucified, another hanged himself, still others, the strangers, were buried one after another in the field of blood. Only the thirty ringing coins remained in circulation. Wherever those silver pieces roll, my story shall follow. I'll begin. So I really enjoy the writing of this, so I definitely, definitely will be continuing on uh, with autobiography, autobiography of a Corpse. Um, and I think the title story is actually the first and it's one of the longer ones, so I may try to get through that one tonight. Then we have my other stuff, more translated stuff. So I have um, Shadow of the Wind. I am going to start this this weekend. This was one of my owned priorities from my physical TBR shelf that I definitely want to get through for Translate-a-thon. Right, so then I went a little bit crazy with um, in being inspired by Translate-a-thon. I wandered the shelves at the library and I was able to pick up a bunch of stuff. Um, I got some great ideas. So um, this is what I picked up. <laughs> um, first up, and I will talk about these more after I've read them, I think, rather than um, reading them all off. But this is um, Drive the Plow Over Your Bones by Olga Tarkarchuk, and that is translated by uh, Antonia Lloyd-Jones. And this is, I believe, a kind of thriller murder mystery in a snowbound Polish village with some sort of... Um, speculative element uh, in madness. So it sounds very interesting. Um, Tkarczuk is a very well-known author um, for both this and Flights, um, so I've wanted to pick up her work for a while. Um, and then I have Quality Land by Mark of Kling, and this one I think is often compared to Black Mirror episodes, so it's going to be like a a corporate dystopia. Um, I think Quality Land is a symbol for a certain large uh, global bookseller. And um, let me check who the translator is. This one was translated from German. Uh, translated from the German into English by Jamie Lee Sear Searle. Uh, and then, and I don't think this one is actually translated. I think the author writes in English. But this is Before She Sleeps by Bina Shaw, and the author is a Pakistani author uh, living and writing in Pakistan. So um, it kind of drew my eye from that perspective. Uh, so this one is a feminist dystopia that I believe involves um, women being in marriages with multiple men maybe where there's a gender disparity so um, there is a major gender element there and i think there's also a major climate element to that as well so this one um i don't know if it's particular to my library system but on overdrive this is an always available title so it uh, doesn't require individual licenses so if you do have overdrive this might be worth checking out and I think that's it for books. <laughs> that is a lot. Um, so this is going to take me forever to clean up all these stacks of books. Um, and 
forever to read, hopefully not, but um, with the speed I've been going at, it will probably be done in a couple of weeks. <laughs> Here's to hoping. Um, a couple of things I have to mention otherwise are uh, Tofukado and Books has been doing just really great high effort content and um, just recently started a series of meals from books. And just this week, uh, there was a video of a honey glazed quail with a pea puree and Tofukado and Books made it seem very easily achievable and totally doable as someone who doesn't get into super complicated recipes. So I really recommend that video. Um, it's a small channel and like I said, very high effort content that should be getting out to a lot more people than it is reaching. So definitely check that out and I will link it down below. Uh, then I also watched this week, it's from a couple weeks ago, but more people should watch this. Uh, Murder by the Book hosted a panel uh, with some of the authors and editors of a recently published anthology. I think it's World's Best F SF. And um, the panel that they hosted was Sylvia Moreno Garcia, Lavi Tidar, RSA Garcia, and Yi Shang Ying. And um, I knew of three of those authors and I've read, um, obviously Sylvia Moreno Garcia is very well known, a uh, Mexican Canadian author. Um, Lavi Tidar is an Israeli author and editor of this collection. Um, and uh, RSA Garcia is from Trinidad and Tobago, um, still living and working there. And uh, Yisheng is the only one that I did not know and had never heard of. And uh, he was such a delight and a joy to watch. He was, you know, just has personality. Um, so I really enjoyed watching it. Um, Yisheng ended up moderating and it was a wonderful panel. Uh, they really talked about a lot of uh, dense topics, but kind of the springing off point that they went down was the gatekeeping that happens with Western audiences um, about genre fiction particularly. And um, that was just so interesting to hear them pick that apart from the international author perspective of both the readers they're trying to reach and also the publishing side. So I absolutely recommend that discussion. And then they mentioned that as promotion for this, um, there may be some other bookstores doing panels um, with different authors from this anthology. And it is an anthology of uh, sci-fi from international authors. So um, they had quite, quite a few in there. Um, so I definitely will be looking to check out maybe if there are other panels to watch online. So that is what I recommend this week. Um, I will link all of that below and list all of the books I've talked about. So I hope that you guys are having a great reading week, like I said, and I do also want to hear if you are participating in Translatathon, if you've read any great translated works yet. So thank you so much for watching. If you want to see more, please like and subscribe.